open up with a word of prayer. Father God, I just thank you for uh, this morning and the gift of uh, your word, um, just being able to come before you in your presence, um, sing to you, and the gift of um, your people gathered here together, Lord. I pray that um, we just be able to take some time and just soak in it and appreciate it and worship you because of it, Lord. Um, I pray these things in your name. This morning, we are in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 to 22. So if you guys have your Bibles, you can turn to that. Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. When I was in middle school, one of my biggest struggles in church was, I don't know, I called it the elbow twitch, okay? I'd be sitting in service, and maybe some of you have this right now. I'd be looking at the preacher, like, concentrate, Daniel, concentrate, and then it would have to go. The elbow. Hey, but, and I would start talking about some video game or whatever with my friends, or it would just be like, oh, wait, 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 focus. This is God's house. You know, I was like really Christian y, little big Christian kid. This is God's house. Focus on God. And Whatever the guy's preaching about, I don't really know what he's preaching about, but I want to talk to um, John about, you know, this game we're playing. It's usually a game, right? It's usually a video game or a board game or something, a card game or something. So I had this big struggle in my life. And then the worst thing about it is my parents would always come and tell me, church is about God, not God. Church is about God, not friends. I'm like, oh no, do I go to church for God or do I go to church to see my friends? It was like, I, I really thought in my heart of hearts, I probably went to church for friends more than God. And it was really um, kind of guilty. It made me feel really, really guilty. Okay. But I'm here to tell you that that delineation, that that, that dichotomy between God and friends, Friends at church is a false one. Okay? That separation between the people that are right next to you and God, like, let me focus on God, not the people next to me, that is a false, what they call false dilemma or false dichotomy. It's not really that separate. Okay? It's not really two completely different things. The gospel at its core is this community. The gospel, that's what I want you guys to take away from today. The gospel at its core, the, the, the very essence of the gospel, not a peripheral thing, not a side thing, but the gospel at its core is the people of God. It's a core element of the gospel. Let's look at our passage. It's Ephesians chapter 2, 11 to 22, once again, okay? But before we get into our passage, I want to talk a little bit about what they call the context. A little, the passage a little bit prior to this, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And you can, can briefly scan over it if you want. I'm not going to read it or get into it. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, it's just awesome. Why? Because it talks about we were dead, but then we were made alive in Christ. Okay? It's the gospel. It's like you were dead, you didn't know God, and you were made alive. That's what Ephesians chapter 2, 1 to 10 talks about. And then a very famous verse, verse 8, right? It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's a pretty famous verse. I've been mean, our well-known passage. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but if not, you should. <laughs> it's very. It's a key core verse that really describes the gospel and how it's all about grace, okay, and not what we've done. So this is really awesome. It talks about the gospel. It talks about being made alive. And that's what's right before our passage today. Okay? 
And then our passage in verse 11 starts off with this one word, therefore. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. And then it goes on and on and on. Okay, once I read that verse, probably the first time I read that verse, I'm just like, Gentile, uncircumcision. Okay, checking out right now, okay? <laughs> the verse prior, those are cool. It's about like grace and works and like, I know what those are. Gentiles, uncircumcised, what? Ah, mm. And then you lose me. You lost me, right? Paul, you lost me, okay? <laughs> but th that's what I kind of want to like unpack it a little bit here. Unpack it. What was going on? What is Paul talking about with these Gentiles and this uncircumcised and all of this? Well, the people he's writing the book of Ephesians to are what you would call Gentiles, okay? And what is a Gentile? A Gentile is someone who was non-Jewish, not Jewish at that time, okay? Paul was Jewish. And to, or, in order to understand this, you kind of have to understand that Jews had a very exclusive understanding of their relationship with God. So Jews are, you know, a, an ethnicity, a race of people, and they thought that they had a very special relationship with God because God had done so many things and chosen them. And they did have that special relationship with God. And then what did they do with that? They told other people who were not Jews that you don't have that special relationship with God. You are not part of us. You are not part of the people of God. You don't, you are aliens, you know, foreigners. We don't associate with you, okay? So that's what the Gentiles and the Jews were. And they did not associate with each other. They did not get along. They had, they were very separate. I remember when I was in uh, elementary school, I moved to a new school in fourth grade, okay? And when I got to this new school, I was... My, my old school, every, all the boys just played together. But at this new school, it wasn't like that. There were two groups. And I didn't know what these two groups were. I just started hanging out with one of the groups. And then I realized that the groups, I, the group that I chose, the boys that I was hanging out with, were the not cool kids. Right? They were, and then the cooler ones would come over and make fun of us. Right? And... I was like, how come I'm part of this group and not that group? And what, what makes this group different from that group? And I realized, because I wore glasses. <laughs> Everyone in the non-cool group wore glasses. I was like, that's it. It's the glasses and, not, and the non-glasses people, okay? So if you wear glasses, you are not cool. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so one day, another new kid came to school. And... I was like, oh, I remember what it was like to be the new kid. A new kid came, and he did not wear glasses, right? But I was the first one to talk to him. I said, hey, you want to play with us? And he's like, oh, sure, I'm part of, uh, he's like a new kid, right? He has no friends. Probably a little bit worried about making friends. I was so friendly, right? <laughs> you want to play with us? And he played with us, right? And we played ball, you know, like, or square, or handball, or soccer, or whatever, right? For like two weeks. And then slowly, he started playing with the other group. And eventually, he stopped playing with us and was part of the other group. I was like, oh man, he realized he doesn't wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and so, he, there's two groups in my, my um, elementary school. And they, we didn't get along. One excluded the other group. And that's kind of what's going on here. There was an in-group, a group of the, the Jews. They were the in-group. And they had excluded some of the Gentiles. And what's worse than that, it wasn't just about friends. It was, not only are you excluded from hanging out with us, you're excluded from hanging out with God. You can't have a relationship with God because you're not Jewish. Okay? And that's what Paul, Paul is talking about here. He's like, remember you, that formerly you who were called Gentiles by birth and uncircumcised. Okay, what is uncircumcised? Uncircumcised is 
a ritual that people would do to mark them as Jewish. Okay? They were, it's, you know, it's kind of graphic, <laughs> but it was something you do to the men. men. <laughs> you cut off a certain part. Okay, anyway. But anyways, moving on, the main <laughs> point of that is it's just a marker, a, a physical marker similar to, you know, wearing glasses or something like that, that differentiated the Jews from the Gentiles. Okay? Verse 12, it says, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise. Okay? So that's what we're talking about here. The Jews considered the Gentiles foreign, separate. Christ, he is Jewish. So you were separated from Christ, right? Excluded from the citizenship of Israel. You are not a Jew. You are not part of our country. You are not a citizen. You are in the out group. The Jews, the Israelites, they were citizens. They were in the in group. Okay? What's worse than that is that it says, without hope and without God in the world. If you were not Jewish, you did not have God. And you did not have hope. You didn't even have hope. That's pretty bad. So, verse 13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. And this is the gospel. Through Christ, we've been brought near to God. Christ has drawn us close to him. It says, you were excluded, you were an outsider, but now you're brought near, okay? But it's not just brought near to God. It is brought near to God, but it's not just brought near to God, okay? Let's continue reading on. Verse 14, it says, For he himself is our peace, who made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Christ not only... When I first read this, I thought, oh, there's a dividing wall of hostility between human and God. Between men and our, our God, right? But that's because I skipped verse 11. That's because I didn't understand what he's talking about with the Gentiles and all that. But when you read it, it says the two become one. Those are two groups of people. The Jews and the Gentiles. They became one. The dividing wall that separated them, the glasses, <laughs> are were destroyed, right? And this is what Jesus did. And this is exactly echoes what, you know, the, the previous sections where it says we were made alive. Christ made us alive. Here it says Christ not only made us alive, he brought two and made them one. Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came to preach peace to those who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So we both now have access to God. And that's basically, there. it says a lot more than that. Can't get into all of it. Basically, that's what I want you to know. We both have access to God through Christ now. Okay? Verse 19, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's house. So he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, You have access to the Father. Done. He doesn't say that. He says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens. You are part of the citizenship of Israel, is what he said. The Gentiles are fellow citizens. They are part of the people of God. Paul doesn't say this just because, oh, it's a side benefit. You're saved. Part of your membership and being a Christian is you get to be a citizen of Israel. No, it's not like that. When you're saved, you become a part of the people of God. And actually, that is what salvation is, entails, is being part of the people of God. 
God has a relationship with his people. It, he always works through relationship with people, not, he doesn't just do it individually, okay? It's always with people. And that's why immediately after he talks about being saved by grace, he cannot help but talk about being part of the people of God. And if you read the entire book of Ephesians, that's what the entire book is about, okay? It's not about salvation for me personally. It's about being a part of a community of people of God, and that is what salvation is, okay? That is what salvation is. So, I remember when I was in, I think, college, I had a choice. I could either continue to serve in youth group or go to this one college fellowship that I wanted to go to. And I was like, what is more important? What is more important? Should I go to this college fellowship or should I serve in YouTube? And I thought to myself, you know, the most important thing <coughs> is to serve God and serve his people. Right? So I said, I don't need community. I mean, it's nice, and I think God kind of wants me to have it. But serving in youth group, serving his people is more important. And that's exactly what I do not want you guys to think. That's not what's pictured here. What's pictured here is a community, an intimate body that serves God as a body. You don't serve God on your own. There's no such thing as I'm going to serve God on my own and without the church, without anybody around us, around me. I want to be, have some friends. I want to have some fellowship. But, you know, maybe God's calling me to a place in my life where I don't need it or I'm not going to have it for a little bit. That's not, let me tell you right now, that's not what God's calling you to do. If you're ever thinking about that, that's not what God's calling you to do. God's calling you to serve within a community, to serve as a people, okay? It says in um, verse, okay, let's, he's, Paul's going to talk, he's already given an analogy about the nationhood, citizenship, and he's already talked about a body, being one body in Christ. Now he's going to give us another illustration, which is a building. A building, right? Verse 20, it says, Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. What is a temple? The temple is where you worship God. The temple is where people worship God, where we see God, where God's presence is. It's where you serve God, where you offer him the glory that he's due. And that's what we're trying to do as when we serve. We're trying to worship him. We're trying to offer him our life. But you know what it says here? It says that it, we are part of a building where Christ is the cornerstone and that we're joined together. And it's a temple where you worship God. That's the, it's the temple where God is glorified. It's not one brick where God is glorified. It's only as a temple when we're built together where God can be fully glorified. So don't think you as a brick have enough to serve God on your own. I mean, yes, we are all valuable. We are bricks, right? Every brick is valuable. Look, you can see bricks right here, right? If you took one brick away, it's pretty bad. <laughs> It'll be a hole in the wall. But one brick by itself does not make a building. We cannot worship in a brick. Okay? So, all of us are these bricks. And we are built together. Join, it says. Join. Look at that brick right there. Can you differentiate between that brick and the next brick? You can. You can see it. But it's kind of hard. They're pretty much cemented all together. And that's what God calls us to be. He calls us to be cemented together. Joined together, it says. Really tight. That's really sticky. Right? I want you guys to imagine for a moment. Take the person next to you. Think about the person next to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is exactly what I want to talk about. <laughs> Imagine, put your hands together like this. So you don't actually have to do it. Sorry. Maybe you should, but 
Put your hands, touch the person next to you. You guys are going to go in for surgery now, right? And I'm going to get a doctor, and he's going to stitch your hands together. <laughs> this is the picture that Paul writes here. Joined together. You guys are joined together. One body, right? We're one body in Christ. Now imagine you need to go to the rest. <laughs> What's going to happen, right? You want to sleep. You want to eat. You have to do it with this person. This is the picture that the Bible gives of the body of Christ. It's going to be uncomfortable sometimes. There's going to be a lot of bad stuff that happens. Uh, maybe some dirty stuff, maybe stuff you don't want to get into with this other person, with these other people. But that's the picture where, that Christ gives us, that God gives us, that we are joined together as a temple. And that's the way we worship Him. That's the way... We do the good works that God prepared, prepared in advance for us to do. There's no other way. You cannot do it on your own. And I'm not saying this is easy, obviously. I'm saying this is very difficult. Very, very difficult. Um, some of us, I don't know, some of, us, some of you guys are in college. Some of you guys are going to go to college very soon. Some of you have recently graduated from college. Some of you have been out for a while. Once you, I think pretty much once you go to college, that's when you get to choose your own church for the first time. Or you get to choose where you worship. You choose the people that you go. You can choose whether you want to come to Sunday morning worship or not. Your mom or dad's not going to slap you and wake you up and get you out of bed. That's what my right? <laughs> That's not going to happen once you're in college. So you have choice. One thing I want to caution you guys against is constantly going, not finding a body. Not finding a group of people who you can be joined with. Right? That's not the picture of salvation. That's not the picture of the gospel that is here in Ephesians. The picture that Paul is painting for us is being intimately joined, knowing each other, serving side by side, really committed and intimate, right? If you constantly go to a new church, or if you go to your church but never get to know anybody, that is, you're missing out on the gospel. I'm, I have no qualms in saying that. You're missing out on the gospel. You don't know the gospel fully, okay? The Christ, or Jesus, united us in one body for a reason. The Gentiles and the Jews, they didn't like each other. We might not like each other. In fact, I know you guys probably don't like some of the other people here in this room. <laughs> but God united you guys together. And we need to honor that. We need to serve God, be his holy temple, and worship him in that. So I'm going to end with a couple of quick practical tips, okay? Three levels, okay? Three levels. If you're a beginner, a noob, you can try level one. If you're, you know, getting used to this, you can try level two. If you think you got it all together, go for heroic level. You know, try level three, right? It's going to be hard. Okay. Level one. If, if you're just starting out, hang out with somebody. Hang out with your best friend here. Hang out with anybody that you like. Go to lunch with them. Say, or if you're at school, just say, hey, can I eat with you? Right? Call them up. If it's summer right now, right? Say, hey, come over and play. You right? Come over and play some video games with me, or, or let's go shopping together. That's step one. If you have, if you're not hanging out with someone in the body, in our church, in the, start that relationship. Up. That's that's hopefully that's pretty, you know, doable, right? Just try it. Commit it. I, I, I know if you go home right now and you don't think about it, you're just going to forget. Think about it right now. Tell yourself, I'm going to do this. Okay? If you already do that, if you already are hanging out with people, spending time with people, this is level two. A little bit harder. A little bit harder. Okay? Pick someone you don't like and do that same thing. Pick someone who kind of annoys you and hang out with them. 
right? There. Don't look, you don't have to look around, Clarence. I'm just <laughs> Pick someone who, who gets on your nerves a little bit. You're like, I have about a 15 minute window of patience for this person. Go for 20 minutes, right? And hang out with them. Ask them to hang out with you. Ask them to have lunch with you. Maybe it's someone you just, maybe you're not annoyed with them, but someone you just don't ever talk to. Ask them to go to lunch with you, right? I had lunch with um, Uncle Steve, this, this um, Ryan's dad. I never eat lunch with him. It was yeah, a little bit awkward. <laughs> but uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to step out of my comfort zone, right? Clarence told me to do this. So now I'm telling you guys to do this, right? Step out of your comfort zone. It's not that bad, okay? Level three. This is the heroic level. This is elite, okay? If you're already doing those other two things, serve with someone. Pick someone, pick a group of people maybe to really commit long-term service. That's hard, right? Maybe it means being a youth advisor and committing to being a youth advisor for two years. That's a long time, maybe just like <laughs> That's hard, right? But I think it's worth it. Maybe it means at your fellowship at school or college, you're going to commit to be on the core group or something like that. And serve with people. Maybe it means saying, oh, I know this kid in youth group maybe, or younger than yourself, and you're going to just meet up with that person regularly to disciple them or pray with them. That's level three. Okay? <laughs> Think about it for a moment right now and pick one. Pick one of those. If three seems too hard, go for two. If two seems hard, too hard, go for level one. Just commit right now, because I know if you walk out of this room without saying you're going to do it, you won't do it. <laughs> um, I'm going to close in prayer after a little bit of, just, you know, a minute or so. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that being part of your people is a core part of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to live into that. Give us patience to love each other, to be to just the time to even get to know each other. Um, and the compassion just to feel for each other, Lord. I pray that you'll show us how we can serve to, with each other as a church more. How we can be more committed to your body, to your people. Lord, we are one body. You made us this. We are your body. We're doing the work that you set out to do. We're doing your mission. We are your hands, your feet, your legs. Lord, I pray that we would move as one. I pray these things in your name.